So welcome everyone to today's climate change and biodiversity webinar. My name is Olivia and I'm the director of programs for the Clio Institute. I'm really excited to, to provide today's presentation. And so for those of you who don't know, the Clio Institute is a nonprofit. We are educational nonpartisan. And our whole goal is through our programs, our trainings and webinars like this is to help folks connect the dots on climate change and drive climate action. So individually, but also collectively through civic engagement. So today's webinar is gonna talk a little bit about, you know, overall, what is biodiversity? How are we impacting biodiversity? What are some of the benefits that biodiversity provides to us as humans? How does it help mitigate climate change and what we can do as individuals? But I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it is, what are some of the benefits, what our impact is, what nature's role is in, in mitigating climate change and what we can do as individuals as well. So often when we think about biodiversity, we think about these beautiful charismatic creatures. And that's, you know, obviously, totally understandable, but biodiversity is much more than that. It's also the odd looking creatures. It's the little annoying creatures. It's the creatures that we don't even see, the, the microorganisms, the, fun, the fungi. So when we think about biodiversity, we have to open our mind that it's more than just those charismatic animals that we're used to seeing. It's everything inside an ecosystem that works together to provide balance and to provide benefits to all of us. And when we look at Florida, this is a great snapshot of some of our incredible biodiversity. On the left-hand side, there's some of our um, animal biodiversity. And on the right-hand side, a picture of our Everglades and mangroves. And all of these components work together in unison to create a balance. And that's because we are all completely interconnected and we can't overestimate, or sorry, underestimate the importance of that interconnectedness. All of the natural resources on planet Earth provide some sort of benefit to us. However, because of human activities like pollution, land management, um, as you know, urban expansion, we are starting to see significant impacts on biodiversity and climate change is exacerbating a lot of those problems. So let's take a little look at some of the main benefits that biodiversity provides to us. So, one of the main things that we get from plants and animals is medicine. According to the National Cancer Institute, at least 70% of all new drugs are derived from natural sources. And of all the medicines that we use, 74% are derived from plants. So plants, animals, and again, some microorganisms provide critical life-saving drugs to us. Now I'm gonna play this next video. In, it, illustrates a little bit how important biodiversity has been in helping fight the pandemic and create vaccines. So please use the chat if you can't hear the sound. I'll just cut the video, but I can give you a quick recap. The fight against the coronavirus has an unusual ally, horseshoe crabs. The animals are helping researchers develop a vaccine against the virus. And Jess Clark shows us how this all might work. They've been around for, what, 450 million years or something like that. Horseshoe crabs and COVID-19. How are the two connected? Well, that's a good question. Dr. Mark Martindale runs the UF Whitney Marine Lab in Marineland. He can explain. All substances that enter or make contact with human blood have to be tested by the FDA to make sure that they're not bringing any kinds of contaminants into the human body. That's where the horseshoe crab comes in. Specifically, it's blood. Their blood is blue. In pharmaceutical labs around the world, that blue blood is extracted from the horseshoe crabs. Certain parts of the animal's blood can actually detect if there are toxins that can harm humans. So all kinds of medical treatments are tested with compounds from horseshoe crab blood. This happens every single day for every single blood transfusion, for every single vaccine that we get. If it passes the test and it's allowed, the FDA approves it for use in human uh, subjects. Here's where the coronavirus comes in. Horseshoe crab blood is being used to test the safety of potential COVID-19 vaccines. So before any coronavirus vaccine would be uh, FDA approved for clinical use in human beings, it would have to be tested with this horseshoe crab test to make sure that it was safe. 
to inject into the human body. Martindale says a half million horseshoe crabs are collected every year for their blood. Some of that blood is removed and then the animals are returned to the wild, but not all of them survive. It's a little bit of a worry because the horseshoe crab populations are, have been declining over the decades. Projects are underway to synthetically generate the same kind of compounds that these prehistoric looking creatures figured out how to make millions of years ago. Jessica Clark, First Coast News on your side. So that is a really perfect example of how critical biodiversity is for our survival. Now, before I found out about the horseshoe crab last year, I didn't even know that this species existed. And that, again, is just an example of the diversity that we see in the environments around us or that we don't see, but that play a critical role in our health and our survival and our daily lives. In addition to that, some of our daily medicines come from plants, right? Excedrin, migraine medicine, we use, the caf we use caffeine from the plant in order to make that medicine more effective. We also use willow bark and aspirin and we use digitalis, which is also known as foxglove in medicine to help with arrhythmia. Basically, every acre of tropical rainforest that is cut down is basically a lost opportunity of maybe discovering a new plant species that could provide critical support for drug discovery and life-saving medicines. So we really need to think, when we think about biodiversity and preserving biodiversity, we need to think outside of our immediate environment because we're dependent on the environment our environments across the globe as well. Another main benefit, of course, from biodiversity is food, right? We all depend on food, we need it to survive. And lots of studies have shown that maintaining species and genetic diversity in our food plants can not only help increase yields, it can also help increase fodder yields. Fodder yields are like the grasslands that cattle graze on. And also when we look at animal species, if we maintain species and genetic diversity within fisheries it can help stabilize our fisheries. I think some of you are probably aware and have recently seen a documentary called Seaspiracy. A lot of our fisheries are at risk or near collapse. And so maintaining genetic diversity and species diversity is really important, not only for those plant species, but also for us as well, who eat this food every single day. And of course, we have to understand that a lot of the plants that we see in the grocery store today do not resemble their original ancestors. And that's just, you know, thousands of years of hybridization. But it's important for us to think about diversity within our species for our survival as well. Another great benefit from plants, of course, is the production of oxygen and carbon sequestration. And studies are showing that in a given ecosystem, when plant species diversity is high, that carbon sequestration is much higher and that oxygen production as well. So we have to maintain that strength within our, um, our environment and our biodiversity to make sure that it can continue to do those functions that we so depend on and not just us, but the other species within that ecosystem. And of course, um, the biodiversity, the environment around us is a huge part of contributing to our well-being and our cultural identity. Um, you know, a lot of studies are showing now that spending just a few hours in nature can significantly reduce our stress Having more biodiversity in trees and plants and flowers inside our cities is also provides a lot of aesthetic value for communities. And so imagine a city that was barren of any green or any animals, right? We can't underestimate the value of our mental health and our well being that plants and animals provide to us on a daily basis. Resilience is another really huge benefit provided by nature. So let's take mangroves and coral reefs, for example. If we have a healthy mangrove ecosystem, a big storm comes along, that mangrove ecosystem is not so beat down by that storm, right? It can, it can withstand some of those stressors and shocks that it might experience. Climate change is bringing more stressors and shocks to our ecosystems. And that is putting a lot of stress on these environments. And that means that they are far less likely to bounce back from let's say a hurricane, a drought or a flood or saltwater intrusion. The stronger our ecosystems are, the more they can withstand shocks and stressors and the more they can continue to provide all of those benefits that we are so dependent on. 
A really good example would be, let's say a drought occurs in an area and decimates um, agricultural lands. Um, that can lead to famine. But what if all a lot of the farmers in the area were practicing regenerative, regenerative agriculture? It's possible that those lands wouldn't have been as impacted by the drought and that famine would not ensue. So there's resilience for our own ecosystems, but the resilience also for humans to bounce back from these stressors as well. So basically what we're experiencing right now is a lot of our human activities are weakening, are making our ecosystems more fragile and climate change is coming in and exacerbating a lot of those issues. And the best metaphor to imagine is that Jenga game. A lot of you are familiar with this game. You pile all of these little bricks together and when they're all together in one tower, they're strong. And slowly you pick one out at a time. And so imagine the ecosystem, let's say the Everglades is a Jenga tower. And slowly we pull out one little species here, one little species there. And before we know it, that ecosystem is becoming more and more fragile, but we can't necessarily see that with, with the naked eye. And unbeknownst to us, maybe one loss of one species can mean the collapse of an entire ecosystem. And this same metaphor, the Jenga metaphor can also go for an individual within an ecosystem. So there are a lot of complex components working together in our environment. Humans are still studying, but there's a lot that we still don't understand. And so we have to do the best that we can to mitigate climate change and also mitigate human activities that are having such harmful impacts on, biodiv on biodiversity. So ultimately where we are now is in a state of crisis. According to the UN study that came out in 2018, they estimated that about a million animal and plant species are at risk of extinction. And down below in that little red bar, you can see um, how many species we've actually lost um, in the past several decades. So a lot of our species are at risk. And again, we are also part of that larger food chain, that larger global ecosystem. And so when these species start to disappear and are impacted, we are also impacted. So what exactly is happening? Let's take a look at what's going on on terrestrial systems as well as our marine systems. On land, some of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss are logging, so forest management, cattle. We know that uh, beef is one of the leading causes of um, tropical deforestation because we have a huge thirst for meat across the world. And that's a double whammy for climate change, right? Cattle emit a lot of methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. And at the same time, we're cutting down these trees that are storing so much carbon. Our agricultural system is also very detrimental. The way we grow crops, our industrial approach um, is hurting our soil, it's hurting us, it's hurting the biodiversity around us and urbanization, right? Urban sprawl, we tend to spread out a lot and populations are growing and our cities are growing and that encroaches on habitat on our surrounding areas. When we look at the largest drivers of tree cover loss in North America, they are actually rather surprising. So 53% is due to forestry and land, land management practices. So there's an area where we could significantly improve. However, even more shocking is that 43% of our tree loss is due to wildfires. And we know, especially after the wildfires that we saw in the last few years in California on the West Coast, that these wildfires, wildfires are exacerbated by climate change. They're getting bigger, they're burning for longer periods of time, and they're, being, and they're increasingly more difficult to contain when they are burning. So not only, is our own, not only are our own practices impacting trees, but also climate change. And ultimately this leads to species loss. We have, I think more than 30,000 species globally that are on the critically endangered list. And even some of our big, um, bigger species like the red wolf, we maybe wouldn't think would go extinct or would be you know, critically endangered, they are. And when we lose those species that are top of the food chain, we see major cascading effects throughout ecosystems. So we can't talk about biodiversity and the benefits to humanity without talking about our pollinators. Bees have attracted a lot of attention in the last several decades. Bees play a critical role in pollinating a lot of the food that we eat. That service is valued at nearly $170 billion a year. So this is 
um, an invaluable ecosystem service, but because of the way we plant and all of the pesticides and chemical inputs that we put in, many of our pollinators are at risk, especially our bees. And in addition to that, shifting temperatures, seasonal changes are also interfering with the relationship between bees and other pollinators and the plants on which they feed. So we're seeing all different kinds of attacks happening and that is impacting our pollinators whom, on whom we depend to pollinate the food that we eat. Let's take a quick look at what's happening with our oceans and our marine life. So our oceans cover 70% of our planet. We know that temperatures are rising as a result of the climate crisis. Our oceans have absorbed more than 93% of all the excess heat that we've produced. So imagine how hot the planet would be without the oceans. As a result of that heat, oxygen concentrations are declining, which is also having impacts on marine life. And because we emit so much excess carbon dioxide, our oceans are absorbing a lot of that excess and that is leading to ocean acidification. And so the warming of the ocean and the acidification of the ocean are impacting our coral reefs in a major way. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia is the most popular one. It, it spans several thousand miles. And in the last decade, the Great Barrier Reef has seen multiple bleaching events. And again, this is an event that is a shock and a stressor on an ecosystem, making it harder for that reef to bounce back when another bleaching event happens, right? Bleaching events do not necessarily kill the coral. Sometimes they can bounce back. But if that same coral is experiencing a bleaching event every two years, the chances of it bouncing back are really, are really slim. And when we zoom into our own backyard, only 10% of the original reef system is left in the Keys. That is a staggering statistic. And when you think about what our economic drivers are in Florida, tourism, people come here for our beaches to snorkel, to dive. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is the reefs are our first defense against storm surge. When we lose our reefs, we not only lose all that beautiful biodiversity and the economic value that it brings, but we also lose that protection for our coastal communities. So again, our marine environments, our oceans um, are valued at you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. It's referred to the ocean economy. And in the US in particular, tourism and recreation account for 73% of the ocean economy's total employment and 42% of its GDP. So there's a huge value attached to what the oceans provide on top of the aesthetic value, on top of being of providing habitat for thousands of different species. But in addition to that, some of these species also impact climate change. And I wanna show you a really incredible video that shows just how much impact the whales have on our ecosystems. Someone is chatting me. I just want to take a look real quick. Okay. The most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. We all know that whales eat fish and krill, and some people, certain politicians in Japan, for instance, have argued that killing whales is good for human beings, as it boosts the food available for us to eat. And so you would think. But as the great whales declined, so did the numbers of fish and krill. It, it seems counterintuitive. Surely their numbers would rise as their major predators disappeared. But it now turns out that whales not only eat these animals, they also keep them alive. In fact, they help to sustain the entire living system of the ocean. Whales feed at depth in waters that are often pitch dark, and then they return to the surface to the photic zone, where there's enough light for photosynthesis to happen. 
There they release what biologists call fecal plumes, vast outpourings of poo, poonamis. These plumes are rich in iron and nitrogen, nutrients which are often very scarce in the surface waters. And these nutrients fertilize the plant plankton that lives in the only place where plants can survive, the photic zone. Fertilizing the surface waters isn't the only thing the whales do. By plunging up and down through the water column, they also keep kicking the plankton back up into the photic zone, giving it more time to reproduce before it sinks into the abyss. Even today, the whale populations have been greatly reduced. The vertical mixing of water caused by movements of animals up and down through the column of the oceans is astonishingly roughly the same as the amount of mixing caused by all the world's wind and waves and tides. More plant plankton means more animal plankton on which the larger creatures then feed. In other words, more whales means more fish and krill. But the story doesn't end here because plant plankton not only feeds the animals of the sea, it also absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When eventually it sinks to the ocean floor, it takes this carbon out of circulation down to a place where it remains for thousands of years. The more whales there are, the more plankton there is. The more plankton there is, the more carbon is drawn out of the air. When whales were at their historical populations before great numbers of them were killed, it seems that they might have been responsible for removing tens of millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year. Whales change the climate. The return of the great whales, if they're allowed to recover, could be seen as a benign form of geoengineering. It could undo some of the damage we've done, both to the living systems of the sea and to the atmosphere. That video, to me, so beautifully illustrates the complexity of how different elements in an ecosystem work together and how our assumptions can be so wrong and how we can't underestimate the value of that interconnectedness and how valuable every single species on the planet really truly is. And I wanna bring it home just for a moment. Some of you may be from outside of South Florida, but last year Biscayne Bay experienced a severe fish kill and the water temperatures in the bay were extremely high and that led to you know, severely low oxygen levels, which basically suffocated a lot of the fish and other marine life. And again, Biscayne Bay is, you know, this beautiful part of our region. It has cultural value, it has economic value. And this was an ecosystem that is already stressed by other human impacts like fertilizer use, like leaking septic tanks. So again, when our ecosystems are not strong and climate impacts come along, it exacerbates you know, the impacts that we're already seeing and it can lead to catastrophic events like the one that we saw last year. Thankfully, we do have a new Chief Bay officer um, in Miami-Dade County and some major action is being taken to protect Biscayne Bay. So that is a huge win for our community. And of course, you know, we are a consumer society, and that means that we consume a lot of plastic, a lot of single-use plastic. Many of you probably already know there's this huge plastic gyre in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There's one in every single ocean, but this is the biggest one. There's millions of pounds of it. It flies off of, you know, the landfills. And plastic is made from oil, so it takes a lot of energy to produce and transport. And most of it is not recycled. It's very difficult. In fact, oftentimes it's cheaper in the industry to make plastic from raw materials rather than reusing. And so essentially what's happening is the plastic is ending up in our marine environments, you know, um, killing, also impacting our marine species and it's getting into the food chain and therefore we are eating it and we are also breathing it. And I want you just to take a look at this photo. You know, a lot of us are immune. We've seen so many of these videos and these photos, but when you really take a moment to look at these animals, it really highlights the impact that we're having on species around us who, you know, 
are just trying to live their life and do their thing. And we really need to take a hard look at our daily activities, our consumerism, our impact, and start you know, changing some of those habits. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's just first take a look at how nature can help mitigate climate change and some of the big important ecosystems that we have and that we need to preserve. So the peatlands. The peatlands are an incredible ecosystem. Um, they're the largest natural wetland terrestrial carbon store on earth. And about 40% of the entire global peatlands are in Canada and the United States. So we really need to protect this ecosystem. It helps mitigate flooding. It helps provide fresh drinking water. It's home to lots of critical biodiversity. And thankfully, two years ago, the UN environment decided to adopt a resolution to conserve and restore the peatlands because of the incredible benefits that they provide. Forests, we know that forests store carbon, trees store carbon. So not only do we need to plant more trees where we've lost a lot of them, but we need to preserve our old growth forests and our mature trees because mature trees have a tendency to store more carbon over a longer period of time. So we can't underestimate the value of different forests, what the value is and the need to protect them. Our coral reefs, obviously, I talked about those earlier. They've been referred to as the rainforests of the sea. And again, the reefs are our first defense against storm surge. They help provide habitat for fish that feed our families, that drive our economy, especially in Florida. These photos here were taken by Rescue a Reef, which is a program at Rasmus, the University of Miami. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end, but they do coral gardening and there are different projects around the world that help contribute to this effort. And not only are they planting more coral where coral has been decimated, but they're doing research to try and find what corals can withstand warmer water temperatures. So a lot of the research that's going into these coral gardening projects are critical to rebuilding our corals, especially in Florida. We also have marine protected areas in the ocean. Those little blue dots that you see in the bottom right hand corner are the marine protected areas that we currently have. Now, at some point, a study was conducted on all of them. And they looked at every single marine protected area and they found that if the area contained those, these five elements here, no take reserve, which means you can't fish, that it was well enforced, that it was older than 10 years old, that it was large and that it was isolated, that fish species could bounce back by 36%. And that is a significant amount. However, the flip side of the coin is that 60% of our marine protected areas only have one or two of these features. And in fact, many of our marine protected areas are hard to differentiate from regular fisheries. So we do have a lot of work to do but we know where we need to focus our efforts. Uh, Florida's wetlands, right? If we zoom in locally, we know that the Everglades are an essential ecosystem and Everglades provide fresh drinking water to millions of people in Florida. They help pr protect us from storm surge. And of course, urban expansion is encroaching in the Everglades and on the biodiversity that live there. Many of the species there are endangered. However, last year, uh, a judge ruled that the expansion of the 836 highway could not move forward, which would have been catastrophic. That being said, there are still efforts to try and build in the Everglades. And without them, we wouldn't have fresh drinking water. We, you know, we wouldn't be protected the way we are from a lot of the storms that we see in flooding. So even if we don't live near the Everglades, we need to think about the importance of protecting those ecosystems. We also need to th rethink how we farm. Our agri current agricultural system is very carbon intensive, right? I think 24% 20, of the world's carbon comes from agriculture. Um, the way we grow is detrimental for soil, it's detrimental for the plants around us. It, you know, it's detrimental for humans. A lot of the petrochemical inputs that we put into agriculture leach into our drinking water and into our soil. Regener regenerative agriculture, sorry, it's a hard one for me to say is one way of letting our soil rest in between cropping. That means we plant a cover crop that can help restore soil nutrients and regenerative agriculture has proven to withstand 
stresses and floods. Like in 2018, the Missouri River flooded and our farmers across the United States saw significant flooding for a much longer period of time. So the water did not recede for months. And those that had practiced regenerative agriculture, their crops were more resilient to the flooding. We also have farming solutions that we can implement. Silvopasture means uh, combining forests with agriculture. So not only are the forests storing carbon, they're also providing shade for the animals. Biochar is a byproduct of burning wood and um, natural sources that are low oxygen, in a low oxygen environment. That biochar can be put into the soil to help restore the soil, help um, maintain moisture and seaweed. Believe it or not, a lot of studies have been conducted recently to, and sorry, have shown that feeding seaweed to cattle can significantly reduce the amount of methane that they produce. So we have a lot of creative, innovative solutions. We just need to implement them and shift our current practices. We also have natural solutions that exist and we need to capitalize on those like bamboo. Bamboo, you know, compared to other trees, the same size, it can, it can produce a significant uh, more oxygen. Bamboo can also grow on denigrated marginalized land and help restore that land slowly. And bamboo matures very quickly, it grows quickly and it can be used for so many different things. It can be used for clothing, furniture, building materials, but of course it has to be done in a sustainable way because there are bamboo plantations that are not sustainable. And all of this is sort of culminating in the fact that we just consume too much. We demand too much from our natural resources, from our ecosystems around us. And if everybody wanted to consume at the rate that we do in America, we would need five planets. And we know that we only have one. America is 5% of the world's population, but we consume a quarter of the world's energy. So we really need to start thinking about our needs versus our wants. So, Yes, we are in a crisis, a climate crisis that's impacting biodiversity, but there is opportunity. So if we look at global emissions, and this is based on the book Drawdown, which I highly recommend you read. It highlights the one top 100 solutions to climate change. Our biggest sources are electricity production, food and agriculture, and industry. And now I'm gonna sort of highlight a little bit in each one of these buckets, where some of the most um, valuable solutions lie, the ones that have the biggest impact. So if you look at our electricity production, obviously shifting away from fossil fuels like oil, coal, and gas, which emit a lot of greenhouse gases or heat trapping gases, we need to move toward clean renewable energy like solar, for example. In food and agriculture bucket, we need to address our food waste, right? We waste an enormous amount of food. In America, 30, 30 to 40% of our food is wasted. And we need to shift our diets toward a plant-based diet. Because as I mentioned earlier, our desire for cattle and meat is driving deforestation and considerably contributing to climate change. In industry, we need to address refrigerants. So anything that cools like a refrigerator, um, air conditioner or a freezer, these processes emit hydrofluorocarbons and they are very powerful greenhouse gas and so on and so forth. But in addition to reducing and mitigating our emissions, we also need to support our ecosystems. So we need to support our sinks, right? Our terrestrial sinks, our marine sinks. So we need to protect, restore, we need to shift our agricultural practices. We need to figure out how we can use degraded land to the benefit of, of us and the ecosystems around it. And of course, we need to do this through education, which inevitably leads to a healthier planet and a healthier population. So one of the big questions we get at Clio is what can I do? And we always say, start with a conversation. And that might seem elementary to some of you, but it's not. And if you look at the, the little graphic on the bottom right-hand side, according to the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, which are these surveys they do across the United States, while seven out of 10 Americans believe climate change is happening, less than four out of 10 actually talk about it. So we can't underestimate the value of actually just having a conversation about climate change and biodiversity. And the second step is we need to take personal action. And this is an action plan that we give out into some of our programs at Clio. 
And again, this might seem like a, a weird exercise for some of you, but actually putting down your goals, your short-term, medium-term and long-term goals can be a way of holding yourself accountable. It can be a way of coming up with creative solutions and really challenging yourself to make changes in your life in these four main sectors, energy, transportation, food, and increase our civic engagement. So we know that we have lots of amazing renewable energy sources out there. We need to harness them and move toward that and away from fossil fuels. And you know, there is some great positive news. Solar really is picking up. In fact, it employs far more people than the fossil fuel industry. And we can see that wind is picking up as well. But we do have a long way to go in Florida. Only 1% of our portfolio comes, our energy portfolio comes from solar and we are the sunshine state. So we need to not only, you know, if we can personally go solar, that's a great option. But if we cannot, we need to advocate for better solar policy across our state and for our communities. We have to make it easier for people to go solar. And we also have to make sure that when we're transitioning in this, you know, away from fossil fuels, that we're doing it in a just way. Low wealth, low income communities spend up to three times more on their energy and utility bills than more affluent communities. So we have to make sure that everyone is included in this transition when we move away from oil, coal, and gas. And again, there's lots of things that we can do individually, right? To, to sort of reduce the amount of impact that we're having, mitigate our emissions. One of the great things we can do is just plant more green. It helps cool, it can help cool our house, our business, planting green roofs, but it can also provide habitat for local biodiversity. And again, food waste is in the top 10 solutions to climate change. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest polluter in the world after China and the United States. Uh, I'm not gonna show this video because I don't, I don't have time at the moment, but all the energy that goes into making that food, right? All the petrochemical inputs, the fertilizers, transporting that food, packaging that food. It's not just the food that's wasted, it's all of that embodied energy. And we need to find creative ways to reduce our waste, not only individually, but as cities and municipalities as well. And there's a lot of things that we can do. Like on an individual level, simply you know, make a list when you go to the grocery store, plan your meals. You don't go to the grocery store, buy all kinds of things that you don't want at the end of the week that go bad. But there's also creative businesses out there that can help us reduce our waste. Thing, um, businesses like Hungry Harvest or Misfits, they will bring food to your house, like in a box, produce, that would otherwise have been thrown out. So sometimes it's because a farm may have overproduced or sometimes it's because the fruits and vegetables look funny and they didn't make the cut to get into the big grocery stores. I subscribe to Hungry Harvest and I'm very happy with the service. The food that I get is beautiful and I'm really excited to know that I'm buying produce that would have contributed to methane emissions had I not been purchasing it. We can also compost, we can compost at home. And if there's no place in your community, some communities have small scale composting initiatives and projects like Back to Earth, we can start advocating for our city and our county to implement composting so we can divert a significant amount of our waste. And then there's organizations like Food Rescue US and we have a chapter here in Miami run by an incredible woman named Ellen and Food Rescue Connects, you can be a volunteer. So as a volunteer, you're connected with say a restaurant or a cafe that is donating food at the end of the day and you're driving it to a place in need, like a shelter, for example. So there's a lot of different ways that we can help divert food waste, but we really have to make conscious changes. Ultimately, our food systems, we need to rethink them. One, one of the best things we can do is buy local and buy seasonal. We really need to support our local farmers, but food that is locally grown does not travel as far. There's less, emiss less emissions, right? So there's less carbon footprint. Eating seasonal also means that we're not purchasing products that you know, might not be in season in Florida, but we're buying them from South Africa somewhere. And that has to travel a really long distance. We need to advocate for more farmer's markets. We only have a few in the Miami-Dade County area and they're not accessible to everybody. So that not only allows us better access in our communities to fresh food, but also supporting our local small farmers. We need to advocate for more composting 
more community gardens. Community gardens provide health benefits, they provide aesthetic benefits, educational benefits. So the more we start shifting our food systems, the healthier our urban populations can be and the happier that we can be as well. And again, related to diet, we really need to shift away from meat and toward plant-based diets. This is not easy for everyone and that's totally understandable, not telling you to become a vegan or a vegetarian, but challenge yourself. Challenge yourself, maybe try and start with meatless Mondays, right? There are a lot of different recipes out there. The internet is full of vegetarian ideas. It's not only good for your pocketbook, but it's also good for your health and it's great for climate change. And again, we can't emphasize enough the importance of greening our cities and greening our homes. There are a lot of different ways that we can do this. It cools our cities, so it helps combat the urban heat island effect that, that increases the, the heat that we're already feeling from climate change. It can provide habitat for species in an urban environment, and it also has an incredible aesthetic value. We also need to shift our transportation, right? We need to electrify our public transportation. We need to electrify individually. We also need new infrastructure across the world, especially in the United States, so we can transition away outside of our cars and use alternative modes of transportation. Um, I'm a cyclist, I'm an avid cyclist, but I have not been since I moved to Florida because I don't feel safe on the roads here because I don't feel like there's enough infrastructure to make me feel safe to ride my bike. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. So imagine a city that has you know, designated bike lanes. It's, it's, it's an incentive for people to get out of their car, get outside. And it's also good for your health as well when you start you know, driving less and walking more and exercising more. And again, just general lifestyle changes can have a huge impact. Um, we, you know, especially during the pandemic, we shop a lot online and that's understandable. It's easy. And some of us don't have access to a car. Some of us cannot, you know, it's harder for us to get up and go to stores and that's understandable, but think about the little things that you can do. And also, you know, the big things, but shifting our, our behavior often has positive impacts, mental health, as well as physical health. And then I'm gonna kind of end on civic engagement, the power of your vote and your voice. This is really the crux of how we fight climate change. We cannot fight the climate crisis and help biodiversity if we do not use the power of our voice. Now, many of us feel like our voice, you know, doesn't matter, but it does, especially when thousands of us get together and are voicing the same concerns. So I'm gonna drop these links in the chat when I'm done with the presentation, but we have city and county commissioners that make incredibly important decisions at the local level. We have the Florida state legislature. Many of us aren't aware of them. They have been making incredibly scary decisions lately in Tallahassee. We also have our governor and of course we have Congress. So there are lots of places where we can voice our concerns or also voice what we're happy about, but we can't underestimate the power of the people. And this cartoon really illustrates that power. I know some of us you know, feel like it's moot, but it's not. And when we get together, we have impact. And at Clio, we work a lot on local policy and also at the state level. And we've seen that when we get together, when we all bring our voices into one, it does shift the needle. And so I'm gonna drop these links in just a second, but I wanna reemphasize and challenge every one of you, if you haven't, to call one of your legislators or find out who your city or county commissioner is this week and pick up the phone, call and leave a message or speak to one of the representatives and voice something that is of concern to you in your neighborhood. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. I have programmed all of my district representatives, senators, governor into my phone. And in doing so, it's kind of, it's one less barrier for me. So it's one way of me of making it easier for myself to really engage civically. And I'm gonna end on this cartoon. I love this cartoon. It, it, it illustrates how absurd a lot of the pushback has been on, on bringing forth you know, uh, climate policy because ultimately fighting climate crisis means preserving our biodiversity. It means more sustainability. It means more livable cities, clean water and clean air. 
And so we need to work together to make that happen. So again, just as a quick recap, the first thing we need to do is start with a conversation because it's really powerful. And we start often just within our own family circles and friends. You'd be surprised how little some of our family and friends know about climate change and the importance of preserving biodiversity. Second, look into efficiency, look into how you can reduce your consumerism and your waste and see how you can shift to low carbon alternatives when you can. If any of you are avid amateur ecologists, this is a great app. It's called iNaturalist and you can photograph nature, species, whatever it is, you upload it to the app, you share it with other you know, folks that are participating and you can have discussions. And these photos and um, submissions have actually helped ecologists better understand you know, movement of certain species. So this is actually helping uh, research on a larger scale as well. You can continue growing if you want to become an expert in speaking about climate. Our Clio Speakers Network registration is currently open. Again, I'll drop the link in the chat. This is an opportunity to learn how to talk about climate change, get your own PowerPoint deck. This is an incredibly empowering program. We've had hundreds of people graduate from the program since we launched it, you know, nearly a decade ago. We can also provide climate presentations to your church or your club. If you're a youth, we have an incredible advocacy, Gen Clio youth movement. A lot of our youth are you know, helping pass climate policy at the local level. Follow us on, on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn to find out more about some of our opportunities. Um, but we also have action alerts on our website. This is a really easy way to send a message to your representative or depending on the policy that we're working on. So if you go in to get involved, Go under advocacy, check out our action alerts. We update them regularly. And this is also a nice way of finding out more about local policies um, that are impacting us and our community and our biodiversity. So I'm gonna end on this. Uh, every month we have a webinar, like today's webinar was on biodiversity. And next month, May 27th, we're gonna be talking about food systems and climate change. And we're gonna be joined by Ellen from Food Rescue in Miami. So we encourage you to, log to sign up for that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go to questions. I'm also going to drop a whole bunch of stuff in the chat for you. All right. So if you have questions, please just put them in the Q&A box and I'll get to those in just a second. Let me find my links for you. So the links that I'm going to drop are a little bit of everything. Okay. I'm going to put the links to find who your senators are and your congressmen. So if you need the link and you don't know who they are, I encourage you and challenge you to find out who they are. If you want to register for our current cohort, our June, July cohort for the Clio Speakers Network, you can click on this link on our website and the registration page is there. This is our action alerts page. And I also want to mention Rescue a Reef, which I, I mentioned earlier. It's a local program run by the Rosensteel Marine School of, of Rasmus. Sorry, I always forget the acronym. But Rescue a Reef also has citizen science, citizen science projects. And they've recently released a great movie about the work that they're doing. And so the movie is free to stream between now and Sunday. So. I wanted to offer you all the opportunity to take a look at this movie. We've been working closely with the program manager at Rescue Reef and they do incredible work. So I'd like to share some of that work. So all those links are there. Now I'm gonna go quickly to the Q and A function and see. Okay, so first question. Um, let's see. Okay. This is actually a really good question. Someone's talking about how developers, FPL, public, some of these large corporations have a lot of political power. And it is hard to shift the power because power usually equates to money and money equates to lobbying, and then it becomes easier to you know, influence politicians with that money. 
But a lot of the work that we do at Clio is precisely around rallying people together so that one voice becomes a much larger voice. So we can vote with our wallet if we want. If we find out that a certain company you know, doesn't follow certain rules or values that we value, you can shop elsewhere. So that's one thing that you can do. Another thing again is to call your elected officials. I know some of you think that it doesn't have any value, but it does. If we don't hold our elected officials accountable, nobody will. So it's really up to the people. And you know, remember, they work for us, it's not the other way around. So sometimes a phone call can take about one minute out of your day. And you know, I've challenged myself to say that at least twice a month, I will call an elected official, write an email, send a letter, or submit public comment at one of the city or county meetings on an issue that I'm passionate about. Now I do happen to work for the Clio Institute. So that is to my benefit because a lot of these opportunities are you know, really easy, but we try and share that with all of our participants from our programs, in our, in our newsletters. So I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter as well so you can find out more about some of those opportunities. Someone is answering, is asking a question about other local organizations that focus on biodiversity? That's actually a great question. So in Miami, you know, there's a lot of nonprofits. We work with a lot of them on different issues. So when it comes to, you know, volunteering, getting involved, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. And I talked a little bit about what you can do with Clio, but there's also Miami Waterkeeper. They focus on obviously marine uh, issues in particular, but obviously that cross that crosses and overlaps with climate change so we work a lot with them they're an incredible organization let me just put their name in the chat in case you're not familiar with them there's also the tropical audubon society they're focused on birds and animals they do a lot of work you know in terms of ever everglades preservation so let me just put that in here tropical audubon We also have the Everglades Foundation. So if you want to find out more about what's happening with the Everglades, I'd highly recommend you look them up. They might have opportunities for volunteering. And if you've never had the opportunity to visit the Everglades, I highly recommend it. I've been a few times since I've moved to Miami four years ago. And every time I go, I learn something new. And again, it's important to visit those ecosystems around us that support us here in the, in the urban setting, we don't get to see the Everglades a lot and, and, you know, around us. Yeah, Luis put the Nature Conservancy. We have a Florida chapter or a, a Florida version. I think they're national, but we do have them. There's also, like I said, um, Rescue a Reef. They do incredible work and I highly recommend you take a look at that video. And when the pandemic slows down, they do have citizen science opportunities where you can go on the boat with them and help plant some of that coral in those outcroppings that they do. And I think you can snorkel or dive. So I highly recommend reaching out to them because they have some really cool programs open to the public. Does anyone else have any suggestions in the chat of some organizations that focus on biodiversity at the local level? Um, but those are some amazing organizations that, again, we partner with a lot of them. They do a lot of incredible work. And of course, all of our work overlaps when it comes to climate change and protecting the environments around us. Carol put, ah, thank you, Carol Lindsay, the Florida Conditions for Climate Action. That is a great one. Um, all about focusing on climate and health. And again, the biodiversity around us supports our health. So it's important to think outside the box and remember, we are all really closely interconnected. And the more we start to really realize that and, and you know, internalize that, I think the more we can start shifting some of our, the patterns of our behavior, mitigating climate change and supporting those sinks and ecosystems around us so that we can preserve our quality of life for generations to come. Um, we're coming up at 6.30. I just want to thank everyone for joining me this evening. Uh, I will follow up with an email. You'll get the recording and you'll also get some resources and links that will arrive in your inbox tomorrow. And if, if anyone or a friend of yours didn't attend tonight, they'll also get the, the follow-up email on the recording. So thank you everyone. I wish you a great weekend. Um, and if you can get out this weekend and enjoy some of the local biodiversity 
um, and some of the native species that you know we really depend on here in Florida. So have a great night, everyone, and have a great weekend.